So my name is Matt Bernhardt. Uh, for the last five years, I've been a developer at the MIT libraries, working on a variety of PHP projects. And I wanted to talk tonight about um, how we've done a couple, how we have in the past got gotten to a state of trying to keep WordPress development under control um, using a variety of tools. Um, this is not a how to use Git talk, um, but it is a kind of example of the kinds of things that, we, that we've been able to do. So, um, yeah, so we have, so the MIT libraries use WordPress to power our public facing website. If you go to libraries.mit.edu, provided you don't go like 34 clicks in, you will be on a WordPress site. Uh, we have some scary things lurking deep down. But um, by and large, it's a WordPress network. It's a, it's a multi-site network with about 21 different sites on the network. Um, we have, yeah, what's, how many plugins did, did she say she got nervous at? We have 58 um, across 21 sites because lots of different people would, we would, we would hire a developer and they would come in and use their favorite plugins and somebody else would come in and use their favorite plugins. We are trying to get down to lower than 58. Um, but we have, a, we have a, a, a significant amount of code. Um, we've got 11 themes in use across those 21 sites. We're trying to get that down as well. But the point being, this is a rather large technical project. Um, within the developers group, we have two PHP developers. We have a UX group that has the four full-time staff equivalents that, that look at this. So there's a lot of professionals working on this site. Um, I, set the, I do this to set scale to explain what, some of why what's coming is happening. Um, so we were just talking about the importance of having dev sites or test sites. We have dev, test, and prod changes uh, that we get changes that get that get made to code. Work through that process, and we'll go through how that happens. But you know, we t we take to heart the lessons that you don't want to just make changes live on a production site. That's a great way to have very stressful nights um, and kind of all sorts of bad things. So, how do we get to the place where we are? I think we started with a, where, where everybody starts. You have a developer, you start throwing files on the server with F, via FTP. That works great when there's one developer making code changes. Starts to creak a little bit when you've got multiple developers, then you start throwing contractors on, on and then you've got lots of people making changes to code and it's a great recipe for things getting overwritten or people getting confused. And well, I changed this file and you changed that file and why is the site looking like a white screen of death? For a little while, we tried segmenting a little bit more so that you know one person was responsible for these themes, another person was, was responsible for these themes, but that only takes you so far. So we eventually got to the point where, great, we're gonna use Git-based deploy. So we're gonna push, push all our locally written code into Git. And how exactly does that work? Um, so we had to figure out exactly how to use Git for our organization. Um, the way that we ended up using, the, the way that we ended up coming to that problem, I think is the way a lot of people end up, end up solving this problem, where we rely on the WordPress distribution architecture for things like WordPress core and for, and for contrib plugins and contrib themes. Um, but we ended up creating Git, Git repos for every individual theme, for every individual plugin. Uh, the choice before us at this moment was, do we commit everything under all of, every, you know, every, all of Webroot to one Git repo, so that just one massive Git, Git repo, or do we segment into uh, Git repos for every project? And we decided on segmentation because that's the way the WordPress community at large seems to do it. So at this point, I think when I counted earlier today, we had 17, code, 17 repositories um, on our public GitHub account because we've got something like 10 themes in production and seven, and seven different small plugins that we've written over time. Um, every project gets its own repository. And on the developer side, provided the developers all know Git and are committed to using Git and not just wildcatting FTP file, files onto a server, it seems to work okay. Um, but there is a problem. Developers who love Git are not the only people in the mix. Um, we have, you know, like I mentioned, we have a number of UX specialists who are not developers. They don't look at Git. They don't look at Git UIs. They don't look at issue queues the same way that we do. We have content owners who very rarely log into WordPress. We have a communications director who logs into WordPress but doesn't speak code at all. So we have a very diverse user population all needing to work together. So, you know, and sometimes we can. 
they, they want to look at the website, but other times we want to bring them into the development process and, sh and be able to have conversations with them about features that we're developing without saying, well, let's put it on production and then you can tell me if you like it or not. So ideally what we want is this diagram where all the people involved in maintaining the site are looking at a common infrastructure. Developers are looking at something that has code and the, the non-developers can have a system that they can use without tearing their hair out. Um, and people on that side of the, that side of the pl uh, platform like to use tools like Basecamp that are super easy and they like to use processes like Agile. Um, so that becomes a little bit of a tension point. Um, as I mentioned, the GitHub UI, if you're not a developer, can be a little bit scary. So that's where the first tool that I wanted to talk about comes in, which is uh, waffle.io. Waffle, um, waffle is a it's a service that basically reskins GitHub. Um, it sits on top of the GitHub UI. It doesn't mean it doesn't store hardly any information of its own, which is great because it means that everyone's working from the same system. But people who want to use things like swim, you know. Uh, sprint boards or swim lanes or any of that stuff, want to look at cards, look like, look like Trello, they can see things that they're, they're familiar with, but under the hood, it's all just GitHub issues. The developers can, can use GitHub just like they, nor, they, they always do. Everybody's using the same system. There's no syncing involved. Um, so yeah. And yeah. Oh yeah, and it's free for open source projects. So yay for that. Um, and the, the last bullet point, you know, we, I mentioned we have a lot of local projects. We can combine all of that into one board so you're not having to check 17 different boards for 17 different projects worth of work going on. Um, just repeated everything I said. So at this point, that diagram looks a little bit like this, where all your, all your code development happens in one place. People who don't speak Git can interact with the system via Waffle. People who do speak Git or the command line are, are using the tools that they know, and everybody is looking at different pieces of the same elephant, which is really, really handy. Um, so that's the system that we adopted probably two years ago, two and a half years ago, um, after a few too many times of trying to keep Basecamp in sync with GitHub and, a, and why did this thing change and why did that and who was working on that project. Yeah, so once we adopted that system, a couple other things came from flowed out of that decision. And the first one is the one that I as a developer care, have come to care deeply about, which is code quality. So understanding that the, the pieces of code that I'm writing in custom themes and custom plugins aren't going to fall over in two months. Um, there's no, there, not that there aren't lurking holes, but there are fewer lurking holes. And we can have faster onboarding when we hire a new developer because we can point to things like a, the WordPress coding standards and, and say, this is how we work. We don't have to have the endless rehash of tabs versus spaces, or why does your code look different than the way that my code looks? So in order to expl explain, explain how that process happens, um, I can, we can walk through the process that, is, that a developer and a stakeholder will use um, to make certain kinds of changes. So when a developer is working on a new feature, they'll, make their, they'll start a branch in Git, start, start throwing code up, um, deploy that branch to the development server and ask the stakeholder, hey, can you look at this and tell me if I'm close? You know, don't, don't run a rule over it, just like, is this kind of what you're thinking of? And get a quick thumbs up or thumbs down. Um, after that, you do a little bit more rigorous testing, you, you narrow in on what the desired feature was, and at that point you have a, full, a code review going on on GitHub, where another developer is checking the work that's going on, and the stakeholder is then going through and doing cross-browser testing and much more deep um, inspection to say, make sure that this new feature is actually going to do the thing that we want to do. Um, and then after deploy, the stakeholder looks at the site and says, yeah, that did what I expected it to do, the site still looks fine, you didn't break anything yay or wait no there's a regression and we'll talk about ways that we're trying to counteract that but so that's the that's the workflow that we're using kind of on a, on a long arc and i want to talk about this step um where there are where you have because we have multiple developers and we all need to be kind of working the same way you, you have an opportunity for code review to happen so we're using two two tools um one is, um, and this is, this is the one that was in the headline. This other code content one is one that I'm sneaking into the talk, so surprise bonus. Um, but within GitHub, 
you have an opportunity within code review to have um, code analysis tools run automatically on the code that's changing and you can get reports back about is the are, is the code that you're working with good or bad or are you introducing problems are you going to take the site down because you forgot a semicolon somewhere um, so we're using two two tools that do this data code analysis one is called Travis and the other is called code climate um, and they look one of them looks a little bit prettier than the other um, there, which one you, I don't, I'm not going to argue that you need to have both, but I will be able to compare and contrast with what we're getting out of each one. Um, the Travis tool um, runs under the hood, it runs a, a tool called PHP Code Sniffer, which is uh, code linting that will look at every line of PHP and tell you, you know, and compare it against whatever standards you define as to how you want your code to be written. Um, we have it configured to use the WordPress coding standards. If you look in the codex, there's this big long page of thou shalt write PHP this way. Um, I forget which organization did it, but they converted that into a format suitable for this code linting prop, code linter, so that when we run the, te run the test, we find out is the code that we're writing suitable for WordPress? Not just PHP, but is it suitable for WordPress? Um, the one thing that Travis does with PHP Code Sniffer is it scans the entire code base on every pull request, no matter how big the how big the change is. So on a very big theme like our, like our parent theme has untold ungodly numbers of PHP scripts, we get the master file of here is every violation you have. So we get six thousand violations going on. That may or may not be problematic if, like us, you're starting from a from a dirty code base. Um, so, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, Travis also, because of the way that it's structured, it's a configurable deploy script, so you can have, tell it to do certain things or not do certain things. You're basically writing your own containerized deploy of WordPress to one of their testing environments. Um, the other system that we're starting to use, and the one that I think, if you put a gun to my head and say you have to only use one, I will probably choose Code Sniffer over Travis at this point, um, is Code Climate. Um, Code Climate also runs PHP CS. Um, it also, out of the box, is configured to scan CSS styles and uh, JavaScript styles. So, or JavaScript, not JavaScript styles, but you know, if it will scan JavaScript files to see, you know, are, are your code blocks too long? Are you writing awful stringy code, or are you writing things that seem like they're more maintainable? Um, it can also be configured to use the WordPress coding standards, and for me, this is the big thing, it will scan only the lines or methods that have changed. So if you've got a really big code base and you don't necessarily want to hear about the 6,000 lines of problems that are lurking somewhere else, this, it will tell you, oh wait, no, this change will introduce these 13 problems. So go fix those 13 and you're at least not making the situation worse. To me, as somebody who's trying to get slowly deal with a very large backlog of, of technical debt, that is invaluable. Um, but the other th the thing about Code Climate is that it is only capable of performing code analysis, um, which is, I mentioned because the, with Travis, because you have the ability to run a customizable deploy script, if you wanted to do things like fire up WordPress, import your site's content, and then see if that funny JavaScript widget actually runs, you could do things against real content in a more grounded fashion, whereas Code Climate will only ever look down the lines of script and say, well, this line of script is fine, this line of script is fine. It, you can't set it up in a real environment. So there is that downside. Um, so if you're interested in poking around a little bit, um, I would on the Travis side, I would say look at Automatics underscores theme. That's how we learned what we did. Uh, we found out, we looked at, looked at underscores on GitHub Look, looked at how they were doing it and basically ripped off what they what they did. So, I, I can I can tell you that it works because we did it. Um, the other, um, if you want to see more about how Code Climate works, we have a template plugin that we use to start off all our new small plugin projects, and that URL has the Code Climate and the Travis integrations that we're currently using. So, and I'll I'll put the links to this up on Twitter or somehow. So. You don't need to worry about free feverishly typing this out. Um, outcomes of that process, we had to swallow our pride a little bit when we realized exactly how bad some of the technical debt we had managed to build up over time was. Um, if you can't see that, this is our parent theme. After cleaning, after spending a couple sprints going saying, I am just going to pay down technical debt, we have 2,736 code violations in our parent theme. 
that's awesome. Um, but when that number was 7,000, that makes me feel kind of okay. Um, this is the part that I'm really, really happy about. You see all the green. Uh, we, started doing the, we started doing a lot of these, the plugin development after we'd adopted this process. So this process is helping us keep the plugins that we maintain not awful. Um, I'm not gonna say they're great. I'm not gonna say they deserve to be in the WordPress plugin directory, but they at least pass this kind of a test. So at this point now, this is the process, yeah. Is that a dashboard that you created, or is that just a readme file? How do you guys manage that? Um, this thing? Uh, this is a snapshot of our wiki using uh, badges that have come off the markup. So um, GitHub and um, e each tool will give you the opportunity to do markdown, so we just drop that into a wiki page. So I can look at that and say, okay, how are we doing? Are we getting better? Does that help? Yeah, no, okay. Um, so yeah, so now this is the process where um, the developer who's working on a process will commit the you know, create a, create a branch, commit the changes they're working on, and GitHub will, every time they see a commit come in, kick off a process in Travis and kick off a process in Code Climate. So that's part of the code review that happens automatically. Um, you get it for free, you don't need to worry about remembering to check something, so yeah. Are they starting on local, or are they start starting on development? Um, talking about the Code Climate and all that? No, just, just your whole development. Um, our net, because the WordPress network that we have is the size that it is, getting a perfectly simulated copy of production on a local developer development machine has wasted more of my time than I care to admit. <laughs> um, so because we have a dev system, um, if we only had production and test, we would probably do more to set up individual development systems. But we have a dev system, so we might as well use it. Um, and I think you were, you were also mentioning earlier that you, know, you want your systems to be running in as close to the same st production stack as possible because somebody will come in with a uh, Mac laptop, I'm on Windows, our servers are running Red Hat. You know, our ops team already has a dev system that is theoretically the same as production, so we just go with that. But yeah, you can, I mean, you... You have a whole team doing it, so it makes sense. Yeah, I mean, we, we, I do run PHP code sniffer locally, so, I, so I at least I try not to commit, put up, branches where the first few commits have 400 problems. I try to catch that as much as possible here, but some of the full-blown testing, I, we, we, we wait until the first commit hits GitHub. So now going back to that branch, the diagram looks a little bit more complex because now you have developers and contractors paying, paying attention to not only the GitHub UI, but you have these code analysis tools. Um, okay, so the other um, benefit is, and this is the reason why I was asking Je uh, Jen right earlier about ghosted plugins. Um, we talked about that plugin that was compromised and ripped down, display widgets. This hit us. Um, this hit us and caused me to have no small amount of consternation because we have 58 plugins. 